Evaluation Techniques This video was shot at the Interact Event Impact Evaluations, Methods and Terms of References on the 21st of June 2016 in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. In this video we will present you various evaluation techniques which might be of interest for the Interact programs. I now want to spend a few moments talking through with you about evaluation techniques. Now, many of you are on with um, uh, developing your evaluation plans. Um, of course, there is a requirement within the regulations to get your evaluation plan in within 12 months of approval. Um, so many of you are working on that. But I just wanted to talk through with you some practical methods that I routinely use when I'm doing impact evaluation that you need to be alert to or may want to be familiar with as you're starting to think through how you're going to plan, how you're going to undertake, how you're going to deliver your impact evaluations. Okay? Now, many of these will be known to you, so I'm not claiming that what you're going to get now is, is you know, fantastically innovative, but I do just want to run through with you so you're clear what the pros and cons are. The first thing that many evaluations will focus on is essentially what we call a contextual or documentary review. So you've commissioned me, you've commissioned David, you've commissioned somebody else to do some evaluation work for you. What is one of the first tasks that a commissioned evaluator would undertake for you is basically reviewing the context, the documents, the paperwork that relates to the intervention. Yeah? And that is all about understanding, as you undertake the impact evaluation, what did we originally think we were doing? We set out on this journey, 2015, 2016. We'd got the ex-ante assessment. We'd got the programme documents. We'd got various statements from the PMC. What this evaluation activity involves is looking at that and saying, what did we think we were doing? Were we clear-sighted when we set out on this journey about what about the issues we faced. And typically, an evaluator in looking at your contextual and documentary materials will be saying, OK, what problem challenge did these guys think they were seeking to address? Back to our good friend, context and rationale, the case for intervention. What was the practical commitment that we were making in taking this programme forward? Here again, our good friend uh, from the logic chain, the objectives we set ourselves and the inputs. What progress so far have we made, be those in terms of the activities, the outputs, and indeed the processes? Yeah? Because one of the things we didn't talk about this morning on the template, logic chain and theory of change, is the process component. And knowing what we know now in the life of the programme, at this point when we're undertaking the impact evaluation, how logically con consistent is all of this? Was this all convincing when we put it together? And in the light of this and the change concept when, context we're now operating within, do we need in any way to change track? And I need to say to you that there is no embarrassment, there is no problem, there is no shame in changing track on a programme if the conditions within which that programme is operating have changed. Yeah, no problem at all. Interestingly, and I'm sure Maria won't mind me saying this in the context of Interreg 4B, when we undertook essentially an impact evaluation of 4B about 12 months ago, one of the biggest issues that partners uh, commented on was that, although, was that although the context within which, the project, within which projects were being delivered had changed, it was such hard work trying to get their contracts and their delivery arrangements shifted with the JTS and the managing authority that they just didn't bother. So, you know, you're in the situation where we're trying to get to this point here, the world has changed to this point here. Ideally, you'd realign and realter what you were doing, but it's just such hard work to do that, people don't bother. Yeah? And so when we talked to those partners and found out the impact of some of their projects, it was markedly suboptimal because they just couldn't bother with the administrative uh, aggravation, the admi administrative challenges of changing tracks. So always be present when you're delivering project, uh, pro projects and programs on the need for operating flexibility. And when you're undertaking a contextual and documentary review to address these questions, you're typically drawing on those sorts of sources. Your secondary data that you may have brought together from uh, uh, your ex-ante assessment, from your monitoring reports, from Eurostat, 
the original program documents, the application forms, appraisal approvals, monitoring data, and reports, etc. So there's a very rich resource of information that you will be gathering together as you roll out your programs, yeah, that you're building up, which to an evaluator, be that internal or external, is actually quite helpful in terms of understanding. Did we think, did we understand, did we, under, did we know what we were getting into, what we were headed towards? Okay? So that's technique one, contextual and documentary review. A second technique that frequently is used in delivering uh, an impact evaluation is what I call one-to-one -one consultation. Okay? You'll be familiar with this. Essentially, you're asking a series of informed viewers, hey, what do you think about this intervention? Do you, as an expert, think this intervention is doing what you thought it was going to? You might be a commission official. You might be a national government official. You might be a member of the managing authority. You might be a member of the joint secretariat. Expert views on a one-to-one -one basis. What do you observe about this intervention? Policymakers are funders people who work in, adja in adjacent programs or uh, representatives from delivery bodies. Taking their view, taking their observation on how do you think this thing is running. And typically when you undertake these things, yeah, these one-to-one -one consultations, you've got a spectrum of modes. Face-to-face -face is better than telecom, is better than postal, is better than online. Yeah? And that matters because as you move from here, sorry, let me turn it the way, as you move from here up to here, or from here down to here, this gets a lot cheaper. Yeah? Now, if I'm doing one-to-one -one consultations on a job for you, depending where people are based, you know, I may be doing three or four a day, interviews, extended interviews, what do you think about the program? Duh, 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 duh. Here's the logic chain, how do you think the logic chain's performed? Duh, 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 duh. Yeah? So quite expensive. When you're doing it online, you can reach thousands of people very quickly, very cheaply. But what is the penalty you pay for cheapness here? Don't get answers. Quality. And what particular aspect of quality? Level of detail and depth. Yeah. So the more you go for cheap, crudely put, at this end, the less richness of input and response you get back. Yeah? The great benefit of face to face is, you know, I can have a conversation with you and you make a point and I say, well, why'd you say that? Yeah, but, but, but uh, yeah, which you can't do with a questionnaire. Yeah? So it becomes very much more an interactive process at this end with a compliance thing at this end. Yeah? Online is very fashionable at the moment because it's cheap, it's technical. For a lot of evaluation work, it's really pretty hopeless in terms of getting real quality original feedback on how your program is performing. So try and, get a, try and get a bit of a balance. Generally, in my experience, these are very good for really understanding the issues originally. These are actually quite good for confirming at scale what other people have said. Okay? So watch out for that. Particularly useful for scoping the issues and for cross-checking messages from elsewhere in the study. Okay? Really fun doing that, one-to-one -one consultations, particularly if you're talking to interesting people. <coughs> Terribly boring if you're talking to miserable people. Now, third technique we as evaluators frequently use is surveys. Yeah? Surveys, as someone who has been impacted, what is your experience of this intervention? What has your experience of this intervention been? And whereas um, the consultation, one-to-one -one consultation, tends to be relatively narrow cast, Surveys tend to be pretty broadcast. You will typically, in your evaluations, be surveying, if not all, most of your program beneficiaries. You may also be surveying quite a lot of those people who've come to your program and who you have turned down, yeah? Because you want to understand what they've done as a result of being turned down to begin to understand what added value your program has delivered, yeah? As I say, two groups of beneficiaries, those who you intended to support, and don't forget that very often you actually end up supporting people who you shouldn't have done. They just get into the system. Yeah? And non-beneficiaries, typically those who were ruled out from a project, from participation, because for one reason or another they didn't fit. They were a large firm. They were a manufacturer of munitions, tobacco, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Again, the surveys can be face-to-face, -face, can be telecom, postal, online. 
in my practical experience, a well-designed telecom questioner is probably optimal. Using a specialist survey house, they can do a lot of surveys a day with a standard computer script, so we're taking out any biases or uh, any skews in the data. Online questionnaires uh, for surveys, a bit hit and miss. Those who respond tend to respond quite well. You get a lot of people who don't respond. And then jokers who just put in complete rubbish. Yeah. So what benefit did you get from this program? And you see them typing in a billion pounds of the profit. And when you run your spreadsheet yeah, and get your average benefit on profit, you get a fantastically good figure because some Herbert has put in a stupid number. Yeah. So watch out for, again, the quality issues that come out of this. And typically, when you're doing these surveys, what you're looking for is a self-reported view and set of observations from the respondent to what their program experience has been, how it was for them. Okay? The difficulty with surveys is they are very prone to what I call last event bias. So if you've had a particularly good encounter with a beneficiary and you then survey them, you're probably going to get quite a positive response back. And if you've just had a bad row with them or not paid them some money or treated them a bit roughly, they're going to give you a bad survey response. Yeah? They tend not to be, these survey groups, when you respond to them, they tend not to be very rational. They tend to remember you as they last interacted with you. So if you're really good at pissing off your beneficiaries, yeah, think carefully about doing a survey because uh, you might not get a particularly good response back. And the other thing that's particularly problematic, um, and this is going to be an issue for the Commission on some of, its imp or, or some of its wider impact work, memory decay. People just forget. I typically work on the basis that after about two years, anybody who you have assisted has probably actually largely forgotten how it was. They'll know they got some money, they'll know they've got some involvement, but the nuances... The, uh, the envelope around it, the wider experience, they will have forgotten about. You might even get, as we often get on the surveys we do, Interreg who? What's Interreg? Yeah? No, you've just had 50,000 euros from them. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's in, yeah, oh, I remember now, sort of thing, yeah, I need to remember that, yeah. So, again, just be careful when you're framing or your consultants are framing up methods of work for impact evaluations, how best to do it. Absolutely critical thing on surveys is good questionnaire design. I was always taught by my master in consultancy, Roger Quince, which is the Q in SQW, when you design questionnaire Simon, for survey work, you will sweat blood. When you have sweated blood, you know you've got a good questionnaire, because if you get a questionnaire design wrong, wrong 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 times, and you can never get it back yeah, without looking very, very foolish. So be really careful in the design of any questionnaires and the ability to analyse those questionnaires effectively because you don't just do surveys for the sake of survey's sake, you do surveys to get a load of data that you can do interesting things with on the data and the analysis. Technique four, very common one, one-to-many, yeah, a little bit like one-to-one. -one. Again, what are you observing about the intervention? Similar to the one-to-ones but multi uh, rather than bilateral, very efficient to deliver. These are things like focus groups, um, uh, participant panels, um, specialist panels, etc. These are really good devices to actually get feedback on your intervention and program quickly, efficient to set up and deliver, but many people in a group situation won't tell the truth for fear of embarrassment. Not all of you will be telling the truth today because you've got colleagues around you. You'll say things to me personally, you won't say things publicly. Uh, secondly, herd effects. Yeah, so we're talking to a focus group on um, uh, a particular programme and somebody will say, what I really found about that programme was that such and such a thing wasn't very good. And then all of a sudden you see, yeah, I didn't think that either. Oh no, you said that, I thought it was pretty poor too. And you get this spiral fairly quickly of bad news, or alternatively, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, I thought it was really fantastic. I thought it was really, really, really fantastic. Spirals ascending-wise, yeah, of herd effect responses. Very difficult in these sessions when you're running focus groups and panels to damp down the loudest voices and pull through the quieter ones, yeah, 
And they do tend, actually, when you're doing this sort of work, they do tend to be primarily qualitative in observation. This is viewed qualitatively about how the intervention has worked, how the program has worked, rather than uh, quantitative. You can get quant, but it's a bit more difficult. Often a useful device for calibrating the headlines from one-to-one -one consultations or surveys. So you've got that richness of one-to-one -one consultations, some hypotheses, you've got the survey, you've done the analysis, you want to test the hypotheses around that, the theory of change around that. These are quite good devices for checking and calibrating those sorts of ways. Case studies. Now, we touched upon case studies this morning uh, in uh, one of the methods. What's worked well and less well? Oh, dear. Spelling mistake. Intra intervention, that should say. Yeah. So this is about deep diving into particular aspects of program delivery, be that in terms of process, be that in terms of impact, be that in terms of learning. Typically, you do case studies face-to-face. -face. They're a conversation with beneficiaries, participants, whatever. Very difficult to do case studies by telephone or electronic means. Uh, so they are quite resource-intensive. Judgment required when doing the case study to form a rounded view on what is being said. So that tends to require more expensive and experienced resources. Can be hard sometimes to secure consensus amongst consultees. So, uh, you know, let's think about an event, a, 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 a project that's actually got three or four stakeholders and you want to do a case study of that project. Well, you need to talk to the four uh, stakeholders and they may each have different views and perspectives. You do have to apply judgment to bring together a synthetic view of the four, not just four uh, separate views. And finally, when you've got different people on teams working across case studies, it can be difficult again to synthesize perspectives and views across different case study authors and reviewers. And then finally, learning diaries. Now, I only use this twice. One occasion it worked really well. Second time it was a bit of a, bit of a disappointment. This is a bit like uh, the successful thing I was mentioning this morning. This is about getting beneficiaries to record in real time their experiences of the intervention. Does avoid memory decay and last event bias because you're recording it in real time, so the diary is being written as things are happening. Does require discipline on the part of participants to fill in the diary. You do need a recording interval that makes sense to recognize what's happening in the intervention, so a learning diary every day is just stupid, a learning diary every year. Essentially, six methods there that I would routinely use and blend together when I was pitching to do an evaluation for you when my competitors would be pitching to do an evaluation for you. Yep. And what you're looking for, either you as evaluators or using people like me as evaluators, is that you're getting a program of work to progress the impact evaluation that is combining coverage... You want to get as much width as you can, with as much depth as you can, with as much expert perception as you can, not costing you an arm and a leg. Yeah? Okay? And that sort of balancing quality and width of techniques with price is really quite an important one to uh, progress. If you'd like to see more details about the evaluation of Interreg programmes and projects, please check out the different models Interact produced. In each of the models, you will find various materials such as videos, guidance papers, Q&A documents, links and other details.